from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Margaret Clifton. I'm a science reference librarian in the Science, Technology, and Business Division. It is my privilege to make the introduction for our program today, By Endurance We Conquer, Ernest Shackleton and Lessons of Leadership for the Imperial Transantarctic Centenary Expedition 2014. To keep this short, you will have found a handout with background information and biographies on your chairs. We have three speakers. I want to give them as much time as possible. And saying that, part of the program was to include a clip from a DVD. The DVD player is not working, just so you know that Glenn will explain when that happens. Um, if you had a chance to see the little silent film that was showing a few minutes ago, that film came from the nitrate vault at the audiovisual preservation facility in Culpeper, um, where the staff kindly processed it for us for viewing today for the first time. This is footage from Ernest Shackleton's final voyage on the Quest, which was the ship on which he died. It gives you a very good idea of what life on a ship like the Endurance was about. A lot of rolling seas, uh, scientific observations, good humor, um, survival skills, all. These early expeditions were hard and dangerous and unpredictable, and yet enormous amounts of scientific information was gathered. Shackleton's expedition of 1914 on the endurance has moved into the realm of myth at this point in time, but it's a great story. It is no less powerful heard the 100th time than the first. And here today we have modern explorers willing to take on many of the challenges that Shackleton sought. Why do they do this? What is it about Shackleton that captures our imagination and inspires us to live to the heroic ideal? With us are Joanne Davies, fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, expedition leader, Stuart Sterling, expedition team member, and Glenn Stein, the U.S. liaison. Please join me in welcoming these members of the Imperial Transantarctic Centenary Expedition to share with us the story of Sir Ernest Shackleton and the men of the Endurance and the Aurora, and possibly the greatest true story of human adventure ever told, as well as their plans and preparations to fulfill Shackleton's dream. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Many years ago, never mind how long, somebody asked me about being a polar historian. And they, they framed it this way. They said, well, you're a polar historian, right? And I said, yes. And they said, well, you're a native Floridian too, right? <laughs> and I said, yes. And they went like this. Well, how did those two meet? How can you, how can you claim both is what they wanted to know. And, and I had to give it a think. But basically, it's like this. Um, there was a man in the 19th century who wrote a, a little novel called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. His name, of course, was Jules Verne. And Jules Verne had a character in his, in his story, and the character was Captain Nemo piloting a submarine called the Nautilus. Now, submarines, of course, weren't known at the time or in a, in a very, very minor way. And Captain Nemo took his Nautilus to Antarctica. So I basically figure if Captain Nemo could take a, a fictional submarine to Antarctica, I can be a native Floridian and a polar historian. <laughs> that, that's my rationale. And, and I've got lots of those, but we don't really have time for that. To paraphrase an explorer named Apsley Cherry Gerard, for scientific leadership, give me Scott. For swift and efficient travel, Amundsen. But when you're in a hopeless situation and there seems no way out, get down on your knees and pray 
for Shackleton. <laughs> Antarctica is the only continent in our world where human beings have gone and not found their own kind. It is also a place of unimaginable beauty. And at times, you can hear the crackle in the water as it turns to ice. And at others, it's so still and so quiet, there's absolute silence. During the winter, ice actually stretches around the entire continent and spreads out over the ocean. And the continent literally doubles in size. The coldest temperature ever recorded in Antarctica is 129 degrees below zero. The warmest temperature is 59 degrees. The average in the winter is minus 30 degrees. The average in the summer is a mere 20 degrees. Now, these are just averages, not accounting for wind chill factors, for example. Antarctica actually encompasses some 5 million square miles. Essentially, you can fit two of the United States, contiguous United States, in the continent of Antarctica. As to the history, Antarctica really doesn't have the sort of historical significance, uh, or I should say the historical background that the Arctic does. The Arctic history and exploration goes back many hundreds of years. Essentially, by July 1895, when there was a geographical conference, international geographical conference in London, it was decided that Antarctica would be the new area of exploration. Very little was known of the coastline. Nothing was known of the hinterland of Antarctica at the time. Well, this set off a wave of activity. And nations and private expeditions began to form. And the crest of this wave, in fact, was the discovery in 1911 of the South Pole by Roald Amundsen. Shortly thereafter, another explorer, Robert Falcon Scott, also reached the South Pole. His entire party perished upon return. After the pole was discovered, there was a gentleman named Sir Ernest Shackleton, who was a veteran of two previous Antarctic expeditions, one of which he led. And he decided there was one great adventure left in Antarctica, and that was to cross the continent from the Weddell Sea all the way to the Ross Sea. Shackleton and his ship, the Endurance, left England on the very day the First World War commenced in 1914. And in a stop in Buenos Aires, Argentina, he took on some additional seamen. And one of those seamen was a man named William Bakewell. Now, Bakewell told Shackleton he was Canadian. It was a lie. Bakewell was an American. Bakewell was from the North Central United States. He had worked in Canada, but he was not a Canadian. But he knew that Shackleton probably would not take anybody on board who was not associated in some way with the British Empire. And Shackleton had a lot of respect for Bakewell, calling him a cut above the other seamen. This, in fact, is a marker in Scandia, Michigan, of commemorating to Bakewell. And it shows on the extreme left his daughter, who is now 88 years old, and his three granddaughters, all of whom very much keep alive Bakewell's participation in the Imperial trans Expedition. Let's go ahead and get an overview of what occurred during that expedition. At the top of this map, you'll see a red line going out to, from South Georgia Island. This is where the Endurance went after leaving Buenos Aires. From that red line, you go down to the coast of Antarctica, and you'll see where it turns into a yellow line. That's where the Endurance was trapped in the ice and taken along at the whim of the ice until eventually, where the green line begins, she sank in November of 1915. What happened at that time is Shackleton had three boats, ship's boats, taken off and put on sledges, and the men pulled the sledges across the ice until it broke up. They got in the boats and rowed to Elephant Island. Elephant Island is just off the coast, as you can see, of the Antarctic Peninsula. It's nothing more than a rock. There's nothing there. There's no help. There's, there's nothing. Shackleton knew he had to get back to South Georgia to find help. So he took a handful of men, went in the James Caird, one of the boats, and crossed about 900 miles of some of the absolutely worst ocean in the world and landed in South Georgia on the wrong side of the island. The whaling station was on the other side of the island. So he took two men 
crossed a mountain range that had never been crossed before and got help. Not over yet. Took four attempts to reach his men on Elephant Island thanks to the Chilean Navy. They lent him a boat called the Yelcho, steam tugboat, and the men were rescued. So Shackleton got all 27 of his men out of danger and back safe. But there's a second part to the story. If you look at the bottom right hand side, you'll see a gold line going from Hobart, Tasmania, up to Antarctica. That's the course of the second ship of the expedition called Aurora. Now, Aurora was carrying the Ross Sea Party, and they were to drop off men and supplies in order to depot those supplies all the way to the Beardmore Glacier. Supposing, of course, that Shackleton and his people were coming across the continent. They had no way to know what was happening with endurance at the time. Now, unfortunately, there was a tragic situation where the Aurora, while she was moored, uh, was torn loose from her moorings because of a gale, and it drifted out into the ice for some nine months. In fact, it almost suffered the same fate as Endurance did. The men ashore were trapped without proper clothing and supplies, and although they completed their mission, they had to wait until they got rescued. When Aurora finally got out of the ice, she made her way to Port Chalmers, New Zealand, and was repaired, but could not return to Antarctica until January of 1917. By this time, three of the Ross Sea Party had already perished. So that was the overview of the expedition. And I think as Americans, we can certainly sympathize with the underdog. Shackleton and his people were underdogs, but they triumphed. And the whole story is a supreme story of survival. And being the 100th anniversary of this expedition, keeping the memory of these explorers alive is one of the primary goals of the upcoming 2014 ITACE expedition. Also as Americans, we like to see a job finished. We don't like to see unfinished business. And that, of course, is another primary aim of the upcoming expedition to complete what Sir Ernest Shackleton started 100 years ago. So, many of you are probably wondering how it is that some seemingly random British female <laughs> would decide to, uh, to carry out uh, the unfinished business of, of such, a great, uh, such a great man. Well, it's, it's obvious, really. I mean, what a hero. He did such a great job. Um, I got involved, well, I kind of came up with the concept of, of carrying out this, this expedition. Uh, while sitting in the cockpit of an ocean rowing boat. I was at the time taking part in a race to row across the Atlantic uh, in a boat with four other, uh, three other uh, women, um, and our aim was to become the fastest women's four to row across an ocean. And we achieved that, which was mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so, I felt <laughs> so I felt that if I could row an ocean, well, why not ski to the South Pole? <laughs> And <clears throat> I'd always had a, uh, an interest in, in the Antarctic. And during my, my university degree, I'd, I'd studied various aspects of Antarctic science. And, um, but I'd always had a real fascination with the explorers. Um, in the UK, sort of most of my generation are brought up on the stories of Scott mm -hmm. and the other great explorers who, uh, who set out to, um, to conquer parts of, of the world for, for the British Empire. Um, Shackleton featured largely in this, um, and uh, I'd, I'd read both of his books, The Heart of the Antarctic and South. Um, now, the incredible survival story um, of Shackleton and his men really, really struck a chord with me, um, and I felt that, you know, one day I per perhaps might be able to make a journey to the South Pole myself. And, you know, to be fair, getting to the South Pole these days is relatively easy. If you've got enough money, you can just pay for a flight, get there, you get your photo taken with the with the, the barber's pole and the flag and everything, and then you can fly out again. But I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to do it slightly different. I wanted a challenge, something that nobody else had done before. You know, it's easy enough to ski to the South Pole, but hey. So when I realized that nobody else had done Shackleton's route, I felt that this was an opportunity to carry out his unfinished business. So. I set out with this, this idea, but 
it was just an idea and I didn't have anybody else to back me up on it. And I wrote to Shackleton's granddaughter, um, the Honourable Alex Alexandra Shackleton, and I said, you know, would you be my patron? Would you, would you support me if I set out to do this? And I, and I had met her before, so I knew her. Um, and she actually turned me down. <laughs> she said, no, I'm really busy with this other expedition. And, um, and I, th I think actually she probably thought, nah, nah, it's not going to happen. She's not going to do this. But a few months later, I received a, an email out of the blue from, um, from a, a, a chap called Sebastian. And he said, I've heard from Alexandra Shackleton that you want to do this trip. And I really want to do this trip, so let's do it. So we got together and we formed a plan and we made a website and we started it. And that was it. That was as easy as that. But then we realized Shackleton was going to have six men. There's only two of us. So we needed a team. So we set out to, uh, to recruit a team. We put Ava on the website. Um, we, we contacted various other adventuring websites and said, you know, this is what we're doing. And I received not quite as many as Shackleton. Um, he, his applications were over 5,000. Um, but I got 100, which was enough to deal with, to be fair. Uh, so I went through a, a, a rigorous selection process. Um, and I, I'll just show you a little video. Just be, to be part of something so great and to be, uh, to be able to follow in the footsteps of such a great leader, such a great man, uh, I, just, I, I just really want to be part of this expedition. And to be able to achieve a goal like this with other like-minded souls, with other people who believe the same things that I believe in, who are open to what is out there in the world would be just tremendous. What we're going to face, but reality is a I don't think any of us are really going to understand unless we've been fortunate enough to have a couple of people who want to be out there, but I think um, for many of us we really want to stay with them until we're actually out there and we're in. Um, so that's why I'm here. Uh, what do I mean? Did you see me in the video? <laughs> did, did you think you got my best side? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
the, the training is a huge part of, uh, of what we're going to be doing over the next year, um, 18 months. Um, the, the team itself is spread all over the UK. It's not like we all live in the same town or village. And so that in itself is really difficult. We've got to get people together and it takes time. Like Joe said, they've all got jobs apart from me. So, um, you know, we're basically stuck with weekends and then trying to draw them from, from sometimes hundreds of miles away to get together for a weekend is difficult. And we have been using lots of other things. We've been using social media and that to keep, to, to keep in touch with each other. And that's an important part of the, of the team building. We've got to get to know each other because at the end of the day, we're going to be spending 85 days living in each other's pockets. So it's very, very important that we get to know each other and that we know that we can, can trust each other and that we can work with each other. The other problem with training in the UK is we don't have a lot of snow. Um, <laughs> It may, 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 uh, 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 may not be uh, something that you know, but it's not one of the top ten skiing destinations <laughs> in the world. There is a little bit in Scotland for about six weeks of the year, but that's it. So we're kind of stuck, and this is why we're, we're going off to Norway, as you can see, um, March 2013, which is a couple of weeks away, uh, to, to learn some kite skiing and, and basic uh, polar survival skills. Norway again next year, 2014, and then really the beat-up training in Greenland just before we go. And the training that we actually do then will, will be determined by how much time we've spent together and what we've actually achieved in, in, in the next year. We're very lucky that uh, within the team that we've got a range of skills that we can draw on. We do have mountaineers, we do have climbers, and it's important that we, we know some of the skills that they've got and they pass it on to us. Um, for example, crevasse rescue. <laughs> now, this poor chap shouldn't be smiling because he's stuck down a crevasse. <laughs> a crevasse, if you don't know, is a river of ice. And we're going to come across one, uh, the Beardmore Glacier, which is going to be at the, this, uh, uh, the, the end of our journey or the last part of our journey. Now the Beardmore Glacier cuts through a set of mountains and this river of ice is continually moving and as it does so and moves over the land and the terrain it begins to break up slightly so you get cracks on the surface and sometimes they can be just a few feet deep and a few feet wide but sometimes they can be gaping chasms which can swallow up whole teams. So we have to learn how to deal with unlucky chaps like this smiling buffoon <laughs> and how to get them out of there because it's a position that we don't actually want to find ourselves in. Physical training. It's a, it's a horrible sort of term, isn't it? And, and immediately you're going to think about running miles after mile. You're going to think about thousands of press-ups and thousands of sit-ups. And of course, I do this every single day. <laughs> It's, it's, part of, it's part of going there. We have to get ourselves fit. And you probably saw in the video that great British sport of pulling tires. <laughs> the, um, we still do it. This, this is a traded weekend just before Christmas. Um, we just can't seem to get enough of it in the UK. <laughs> we, we can't practice pulling um, her, our sledges or pulks as they'll actually be known. Uh, which are going to weigh well over £300 each. And this is the closest we can get to that sort of training. So, yes, on a regular basis. And if you happen to drop by Joe's house, you will see that there are a pile of these things outside the front door. And she's trying to encourage people in the village to take it up as a sport as well. <laughs> but for the moment, and actually that's me, you can, you can see that it's not nice. That's a bit of a grimace there, isn't it? <laughs> um, it, it does actually... Uh, um, do more than just, just dragging weight. These things get stuck on rocks, they get stuck in the tracks you're walking in, they get stuck on the bushes, and that's the sort of thing that we're going to come across with these pulks when we're actually in Antarctica, because we've got Sistrugi to get across, which is um, uh, ridges, small ridges which are formed by wind-blown ice, and we will have to manoeuvre across them and get across them. They're not huge things, but they're just going to be enough to annoy you when you keep coming across them, when you're dragging a poke for 10 hours a day. 
because that's the, that's the reality of it, that we're going to be dragging these things for 10 hours a day and you're going to be in total silence because you'll, be, uh, you'll have your balaclava on and your neoprene face mask to, to protect you from the cold. You won't be speaking to the man in front, or woman if it happens to be Joe, and you won't be speaking to anybody behind you. You'll just be skiing along and, and trying to get on with it. Just as important as, um, just, I just thought I'd show you a polk. Um, that's actually, uh, that was actually taken a couple of weeks ago in the Yukon, in the Yukon Arctic Ultra. Um, that is nowhere near the size that we'll be carrying. That's only about 45 pounds. And like I said, we're looking at polks of 300. The reason you know it's only 45 pounds is, I'm smiling. <laughs> The reason we went to the Yukon was actually to, to discover um, some of the other skills that we're actually going to need. And the biggest thing we found is acclimatization. Uh, the operating temperatures in Antarctica are going to be between minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the sort of temperatures we can expect on a day-to-day -day basis. However, they do go an awful lot lower, and when you consider uh, wind chill as well, then these figures drop considerably. And that's a whole nother world. It's just not the same as saying, oh, it's a bit cold outside. <laughs> I think I'll put my gloves on. The, it, it, you need to have a whole different mindset to deal with this cold. And until a few weeks ago, I really hadn't been that aware of it. Yes, I'd been to cold places. Yes, I, you know, I've been to the Alps, in, uh, the French Alps and places like that. But nothing like the temperatures we actually got in the Yukon. And the thing is, the Yukon is very similar to Antarctica in as much as it's a very, very dry climate. Um, Antarctica is actually a desert with, with virtually no precipitation um, at all, which you might think kind of strange because of the snow that's there, but it's actually old snow that's just getting blown around. So the Yukon was absolutely ideal. And we actually um, suffered, I'm not going to say uh, endured, we suffered temperatures down to minus 58. And uh, Joe thought it would be a good idea to go out camping in that. So that's exactly what we did. <laughs> <coughs> when, it, when I say it's, um, it's not just a case of putting on more clothing, it, it's difficult, okay? This is, this is a very physical activity. We're going to be skiing, as you can see, pulling these along. And in that picture, if you look at it, it doesn't look like I'm actually wearing that much. And I've only got a couple of layers on. The reason for this is, as you do physical activity, as I'm sure you all know, you get hot. If you get hot, you start sweating. That's a real problem in Antarctica, because once you've sweated, that turns to ice, and you can't get rid of it. There's no way of heating yourself up to, to, to get rid of the water. It stays in your clothes, and you're stuck with it. The sort of things that we came across in the Yukon, and problems that guys had, were the boots freezing. If you didn't put them in your sleeping bag to keep them warm, the sweat that came out your feet during the day goes into your boots, it freezes overnight, and then in the morning they were finding that their boots were cracking as they were going along on the trail. So again, when I say that you've got to acclimatise and you've got to learn a whole new set of skills, being in this kind of temperature is really, really different. When you go to light your, your stove, you can't use a petrol lighter because it's butane, and butane will freeze at around about minus five degrees centigrade. I'm sorry, I don't actually know the Fahrenheit for that. But it's just below freezing. It's not a great deal. So you can't use it. You've got to have matches with you. If, um, when you breathe, this is what happens. That's what happens at, uh, at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I'd been skiing for the best part of uh, an hour when I took this photograph. And as you can see, I'm encrusted with ice around my face, and more importantly, it's on my clothes. You've got to make sure you brush this off, because if you take it into your sleeping bag, it melts, your sleeping bag gets wet, and you end up with a block of ice with no way of getting rid of it. It is a whole different world, like I say. And, and for me, it was absolutely spectacular to be able to experience this before I even go to Antarctica. I now know so much more. At the temperatures that we're, we're talking about, if you spit, it will actually freeze before it hits the ground. 
the inside of your nostrils, if you sniff hard because you're, you're, you're working hard, will actually freeze together and stick. It's gone quiet now, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I'm beginning to wonder if I want to go myself. <laughs> The problems you can get fr fr from this sort of thing can lead on to frostbite and frost nip. Uh, I actually got a bit of frost nip um, in the Yukon, and that's really taught me a lesson. I took my gloves off for longer than I thought was uh, longer than I thought I could get away with. Um, when you're trying to do things, some things are just so fiddly you've got to take your gloves off. Uh, you never take your liners off your fingers because your fingers will actually stick to metal at these sort of temperatures. Um, so you don't want that happening. But even through gloves, you can get burnt. I took my hands out of my gloves to, to try and uh, get the fire started, to try and get my, my stove started. And I left them out too long and I fiddled too long and I could actually feel the pain because that's what it's like. When, when it's that cold, the pain in, in your fingers or any exposed part comes very, very quickly. And it's like somebody's actually trying to crush your fingers in a door. I knew I'd done it too long, I put it back in my glove, and sure enough, the next day, there was a, a white patch on the end of my finger, which was frost nip. If I'd left them out any longer, then I would have ended up with frostbite, and that would have been a serious problem, because I look, probably looked at uh, a bit of, of uh, amputation. And as you can see from this hand, I can't afford to get any more amputated. <laughs> it wasn't frostbite, by the way. <laughs> when you're considering the temperature, and I talked about teamwork early, earlier when you're considering the temperature you've got to look out for each other because they might see a little bit of white on your cheek or your ears that's exposed uh, that you don't realize your hat's come off and that will very quickly turn into frostbite you've got to consider your own temperature as well because if your body drops um, only seven degrees fahrenheit which isn't a huge amount that's enough to turn you from a completely coherent and intelligent human being like i am now all right, maybe not the intelligent, <laughs> but completely coherent into a gibbering wreck and you will become very quickly unconscious and you will be suffering from hypothermia. So this is all new stuff and, and this is things that people pr perhaps don't realise. When, when you see the, the pictures of these places, you think it's cold, but it's not just cold. It's like going to another universe. It's completely different. So that's what we're going to be doing with our training. Um, the skiing is going to be a big part, and uh, obviously the kite skiing. Uh, that's quite a new concept, you might think, but it's not. Um, the early explorers tried to, to uh, set sails on their, their sledges to make them easier to pull. Um, I've just thought about attaching mine to the blokes in front <laughs> as we're going along, but we're actually, actually going to learn to kite ski, um, and it has been done before, and it until I go to Norway I really really can't explain what it's going to feel like but it's just another of the new skills that we have to actually get used to and get very efficient at very quickly in order to achieve. I'm going to hand you back to Joe now who's going to tell you the plan. So once we've completed all of the of the training that Stuart's talked about and um, we feel that we're we're ready to go 100%. Um, as you saw before on, on one of the slides, Greenland will be our dress rehearsal. Greenland's a great place to, to, to train in because it's a very similar environment to, to what, you'll, what we'll experience down in Antarctica, and it's a bit closer to home and cheaper to get to. So once we get down to the ice in November of 2014, we should be dropped at our start point by a, a plane very similar to this. It's a, a twin otter on skis. Um, we, uh, we intend to, to, like I say, cross the continent and go via the South Pole. The distance is approximately f uh, 1,700 miles, so it's a fair old way. Um, and we need to achieve this in about 85 days. Unfortunately, um, that's, that's the length of time that the logistics company will give us for their, for their season because uh, that's, that's the length of time they set up their camp for. And any, any additional time over that is going to cost us rather a lot of money. So. We can't afford to do, uh, to do any more than 85 days. So to achieve this, we're going to have to do the kite skiing. Uh, if we were to ski, um, to ski all the way, uh, it would probably take around about 100 to 120 days. So uh, we can't afford that either. So the kite skiing 
um, as Stuart explained, is is, is basically it's um, you 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 fly a kite whilst you're skiing, and that that requires a lot of skill. Um, obviously, towing the pulk weighing 300 kilos, uh, uh, 300 pounds, sorry, um, and keeping uh, going in the right direction because we'll have to navigate using a compass and make sure that we are going in the right direction um, and also keeping six people together because that's very very difficult when the wind's blowing you so as Stuart said it's very very important that we go and learn how to do this and, uh, and get that get that squared away <coughs> that's what it looks like so the route uh, similar to what Shackleton uh, planned, um, unfortunately, the uh, the only record we have of Shackleton's actual plan was uh, a map that he drew on the back of a menu card during a during a dinner, and uh, we don't have any any further more accurate records. And to be fair, I don't think he really knew either. Um, he was discovering new lands. Um, he wasn't sure where the ship was going to be able to to um, land in the ice, and and obviously he didn't realise that he was going to get stuck. Um, but his, his plan was to start in Vassal Bay, and we're going to start very close to that, um, at a place called Berkner Island, uh, which is where the, uh, the arrow, red arrow is pointing to. Uh, we intend to cross Berkner Island, and then go across the Filkner Ice Shelf, um, and up into the mountains. Now, through the mountains, um, as Stuart mentioned, there's glaciers in, in, uh, glaciers in these mountains, um, and that means we'll have to climb up through those glaciers, hopefully avoiding all the crevasses. Um, and we have consulted with um, an eminent glaciologist from um, the British Antarctic Survey and uh, the Scott Polar Research Institute. Um, he's, uh, he's spent the last 60 years or so studying Antarctica, uh, flying over it, taking aerial phot photographs, and he knows pretty much every inch of, of the continent. So he's been advising us on, on our best route uh, in order to avoid those crevasses. So once we get up through the mountains, we'll be on what's known as the Polar Plateau. Um, and this is a relatively flat area that uh, gradually, gradually slopes uphill. So it's uphill all the way for the, for the first half of the journey. Um, and we will reach the South Pole. Um, and uh, once, w once we get to the South Pole, obviously we'll do the photos and all of that stuff. Um, but we'll also re receive a, a resupply, so we'll get some more food and fuel um, and we'll be able to get the, the kiting equipment sent to us. So Shackleton planned to have, uh, have his, uh, his resupply dropped um, in caches on, on the route up to the, to the Beardmore Glacier, um, but our resupply is going to be at the pole. And then we're going to continue on, and we hope to hit uh, Shackleton's further south point, um, just to, to commemorate that um, as we go past. Uh, in uh, 1909, uh, Shackleton reached this point, um, sadly 97 miles from the pole and, and wasn't able to reach the pole, but it's a story you probably know. Um, once, once we've reached there, we're going to continue on over the plateau. We'll reach the highest point, which is mm, roughly 12,000 feet. Um, and uh, and once, once we're up there, it's downhill all the way. And it's also kite skiing for the rest of that bit. So we should be able to achieve maybe up to 40, 50 miles a, a day, which is fantastic because that's the, the speed we need to be going at. Once we get to uh, the Transantarctic Mountains, um, which is where the Beardmore Glacier is, we're going to have to put the kites away and uh, climb down the glacier. Now, most people um, in the past have climbed up the glacier. Shackleton's done it, Scott did it, um, and, and various Norwegians. Um, so climbing up the Beardmore Glacier is actually quite hazardous and, and people do encounter a lot of problems there. Uh, but we're going down, so we're hoping that might be easier. Um, and once we reach uh, the bottom of that, we'll be onto the Ross Ice Shelf and it should be plain sailing or flying um, until we get to McMurdo Sound, which is where, the, um, uh, where McMurdo is, which is the US science base. Um, and hopefully we'll get picked up there. So that will be our route. Um, the, the terrain that we'll encounter should be uh, similar to this picture, which is actually taken in Norway, but um, there's uh, Sastrugi, um, which I think Stuart alluded to, uh, which are the, the sort of ice ridges formed by the wind. Um, it's not as bad as going to the North Pole, where you've got sea ice and open leads and the potential for swimming and polar bears and all sorts of hideous hazards like that. 
but uh, there's plenty of uh, plenty of distance to cover, and, and the terrain's not going to be all that easy. So that's our plan. That's what we want to do. We want to, uh, as I as I keep saying, finish Shackleton's unfinished business. Um, but you you're probably thinking, you know. What was it that made me admire Shackleton so much? Undoubtedly, I think it was the way he led his men through such adversity, and he faced all the challenges thrown at him by God's fate, or whatever it is you believe in. Um, and he came out of this, having lost none of the crew. Everybody, he saved all those men. It might have taken a long time to rescue them, um, but he, said them, he, he saved them. To lead 27 men out of danger and back to eventual safety is, incre is an incredible feat. But this isn't the first time that Shackleton had shown uh, courage in the face of adversity. In his further south ex expedition, which I mentioned earlier, um, he and three other men, Wilde, Adams and Marshall, achieved the furthest south point that anyone had ever been to towards the pole. Um, but unfortunately, they were running low on supplies um, but Shackleton knew that if he didn't turn back, then they would never be able to make the return journey. So with heavy hearts, they turned back just 97 miles short of the South Pole. But, Sa but Shackleton, you know, I think through his, the, I don't know, through his philosophy and, and everything he believed in, he sacrificed fame and glory for the lives of, of, of him, himself and his men. Famously, he wrote to his wife, Emily, I thought, dear, that you would rather have a live donkey than a dead lion. <laughs> and, this is, <laughs> and, and this is so true. I believe that he was a great leader of men. Um, he proved this throughout his career. Um, but many people would think that he was a failure because you know, some of his attempts to discover new places and to be the first to a place were thwarted by bad luck and circumstance. But in 1901, he, when he accompanied Scott on an attempt to reach the Pole, they failed uh, in their mission, and Shackleton very nearly died on this trip. Um, he suffered illness and lack of sustenance, which weakened him and meant he had to be dragged home by his teammates. But if anything, this strengthened his resolve and made him more determined to succeed at reaching the Pole. So when he set out in 1909, um, he, he truly believed that he had what it took. Unfortunately, somewhere in the planning, he failed to calculate the, amount, the correct amount of food supplies um, required and made the mistake of using ponies. So, so you can learn from that experience and think, well, I need to be more prepared, I need to make my calculations right, and I'm not going to use ponies. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'd be able to, anyway. But for, with the example with the ponies, both Shackleton and Scott believed that these hardy Siberian ponies would be the answer to hauling huge, heavy sleds. Um, but unfortunately, they didn't prove hardy enough, um, and most of them died or had to be killed. Later, the uh, Norwegian Roald Amundsen was to prove that dogs were the best animal to assist um, in, uh, in the transporting of men and supplies to the pole. Um, but despite all this, um, Shackleton was, a, was still a very competent and um, innovative man. Um, he was well informed about the latest technologies in, clo um, in clothing and equipment, um, just as today. You know, we, um, we know all about the fleece and the Gore-Tex and the primer loft um, and down um, and all the other modern fabrics that make polar exploration far more comfortable than in the days of canvas, seal skins, cotton and wool. So Shackleton was really into his into the research side of things. You know, he traveled to Norway because he knew, he knew that the Norwegians knew what they were doing in the cold. So he went there to consult with uh, manufacturers of rain ski reindeer skin sleeping bags, for example, uh, which were the new, the in thing at the time. Um, he investigated the calorific content of foods um, and he tried to make uh, good recipes for, for the pemmican, which was the, the food that they would take um, and, and make sure that they contained enough energy per portion. Um, as they could manage, given, given the weight restrictions they had to, had to go with. Um, so he also actually consulted other polar experts. He, he went to Roald Amundsen and, and talked to him about you know, the, the different routes and, and, and all the things that... that um. So he, he, he really did believe in, in um, using... So 
and so, some people might think that he came across as, as quite an arrogant character. You know, oh, I'm going to go and do this, and and you know, I, I'm going to be the greatest. But um, he had a very strong belief in his own strength. But he also realised that um, he wasn't all things to all men, and that he had his own weaknesses. So. Um, he, he realised that, that he would need a, a team around him um, that, that could bring their own set of skills and knowledge. Um, and, uh, and I think that I, I kind of like to, to think that I emulate that as well. And that I know that I can't do all this on my own. And that I don't have all of the skills and all of the knowledge. So I've surrounded myself with, with people, people like Stuart who, who do have other skills and, and can bring their knowledge um, to my team and, and create a successful team so that we will be successful in our in our mission. Oh. So, unlike many other leaders of the, of Shackleton's time, he believed in in pooling his resources and chose his men from a broad range of people, just as I have, um, you know, chosen chosen the the man off the street. Um, he, he didn't want officers and gentlemen. In fact, it was quite the opposite. He wanted the, the real men, and, and he believed he could get along with these men much better. And, um, and he, he proved that. Um, all his men had such respect for him um, that because of the way he treated them um, very fairly, um, you know, he, he, he was harsh when he needed to be, but it was always, you know, fair and, and, and expected from his men. <sighs> I think one of the other things that that I um, that I feel I have in common with Shackleton is that in my career I haven't always been uh, successful in my goals, um, but I've always gone back to have another go, um, and I um, I don't believe in in I don't believe in unfinished business. So I always uh, always try and learn from the failures um, and move on, uh, either reattempting the challenge or trying something different. Um, and, but above all, I, I'd like to think that I've learnt lessons from all the previous failures, and I will take, take that with me, uh, those lessons learnt. So, once this mission is complete, and we've carried out the, uh, the unfinished business of, of such a great man, hopefully that will breathe new life into the, to the Shackleton family motto, which, uh, which we've been allowed to use, um, by endurance we conquer. So we'll take questions. And if you could just repeat the question. Okay. I'm not going to do my bit now. Hmm? I'm not going to do my bit. Oh, crap. Go ahead. Sure. How many calories a day are you planning for? I, I'm planning for as many as I can get down my <laughs> neck. I, I absolutely adore my food, but t t seriously, we, we are looking at eight to 10,000 a day. I have no idea how I'm going to be able to eat that amount, but I, you know, I'll certainly practice hard and give uh, I'll give it a try. <laughs> Uh, so the role of Shackleton's granddaughter. Well, she she's quite a, a she's quite a big figure in in sort of the the world of polar polar exploration. In that, because she's his granddaughter, she she's um, she spent a lot of time uh, being his granddaughter. You know, she she goes to things, she does talks, and um, you know, her house is full of all his his memorabilia and, and things like that. Um, and I think um, her her sort of her approval um, makes us more creditable, you know. So she's our she's our patron, and, and, and that that means that she's supporting us. She doesn't have any money, so she's not um, she's not able to support us financially. But um, her her support is means a lot to us. Um, so we we you know we're we're um, working with her on that, and and she she has a lot of contacts. She'll talk to people, and so she who are your major financial people? Well, at the moment um, we've got what well, I. It's it's very a new. We've got a new sponsor who I, I can't officially name yet because um, we're just going through all the legal um, sort of 
things. But uh, we we have one um, fairly major sponsor, but um, we're we're still looking for 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 other um, donations as well. But um, yeah, that w- I, sorry, I can't name it yet. <laughs> Here's a question. Hi. What kind of food are you going to eat? What kind of food, Stuart? Do you want to tell them about Okay, the food? well, I, I, I know that you've, uh, you're interested in the hoosh, and, and Joe knows about hoosh, but what we're actually going to eat is um, dried foods. Okay, so when, when we go on the expedition, we, we have to take food with us, obviously. You've got two choices. You either take wet food or dry food. Wet food is boil in the bag that's already made up, or you take dry food. Because of the weight, we have to take dried food. Um, the problem is it tastes awful. <laughs> Things haven't improved since the days of hoosh and pemmican, I'm afraid. And I wish that some of these major manufacturers would take this on board. Um, we have to melt snow in order to get water, because that's the only way we can drink, and it's the only way that we can rehydrate the food. And the best way to probably explain the stuff that we've been looking at um, is it's a bit like baby food. And I wasn't really keen on it 48 years ago, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to be all that keen on it by the time we get to 50 either. But that, that, that's what they do, and, and they can bulk up the calories, to, to, you know, to go back to your question. But, yeah, it's basically baby food we're, we're eating. Rehydrating and lots of chocolate. Food. And lots of chocolate. <laughs> if, if you don't get done in 85 days, will someone pick you up and go by Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they'll come and land where we are and they say, get on the plane or else. That's it. You're yeah. done. Actually, mine was a, a related question to this one. It seems you're using, let's say, this new techn- not, not technology, but this new methodology of the kite yeah. skiing. And you mentioned in your talk, you said about 40 to 50 miles a day. Yeah. I don't know how many days you're going to be doing the kite skiing, but let's assume 20 days out of this total 85. Yeah. At a margin of 10 miles plus or minus is about 200 miles. You know, so have you have you weighed the risk of you know if, what what if it doesn't? I know you have yet to learn it, so you can't yeah. really. Yeah. But but it just seems so many you know imponderables that might go wrong. And and that's the joy of uh, of Antarctica. Um, <laughs> if if you look at all the other explorers, they've they've always tried to calculate what can I do, you know, how can I take this, and all the rest of it. You can only do what you can do. We've got a window of 85 days and that's what we have to do. In um, 1996, um, a Norwegian explorer called Borg Ausland um, did a crossing very similar route to ours but through the Axel Heiberg glacier, which is a different, different glacier. Um, and he, he started at Birkland Island as well. Um, and he set a very similar distance and he did it in 69 days. So you have about 16 days leeway. Hopefully. <laughs> Are you, are you training on the studies? Uh, yes, we have two reserves. Um, so we have the six team members and two reserves. Um, and they, they attend all the training with us. Um, and they have, to, they have to be able to do everything that, that we're doing. So it's a very difficult position to be in because y- potentially you're not going. But anything can change at any moment. So. Facebook, Twitter, really? <laughs> all of that. Yeah, um, we'll have satellite phones, uh-huh. and you can text message from satellite phones. So we'll have somebody back home that's receiving the text messages, um, and then can update Facebook and Twitter and the blog on the website. So you'll have some photos too. Yeah, we should be able to do photos. It, it's very expensive uploading them, but that's part of the cost. You know, we need to keep all our fans informed <laughs> but, but, but just as a backup um, uh, we're going to have these these this new invention um, pen and paper <laughs> um, did you think of trying to um, recreate um, Shackleton's trip bike and use the same um, equipment <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, it crossed my mind, and I quickly dismissed the idea. Um, as I mentioned, Gore-Tex, fleece, um, down. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not too interested in reindeer skins. But uh, yeah, it's possible, and and there is a, a an expedition that has actually just um, just finished, which is called the Shackleton Epic, and they um, they recreated the boat journey. Uh, doing everything replica. So they had a replica boat, they had 
replica clothing. They ate the same food. They, you know, the basically the only modern stuff they had on board was safety equipment that would only be used in an emergency. So they've done that, and they've done a great job, and they've just completed it. But um, I didn't feel that it was necessary. Just add to that, it's, it's not too well known, but had Shackleton landed, he would have actually used two motor sledges, which are actually nothing but, uh, they were nothing but aeroboats on skis. So, so he would have used those, to, in addition to dogs. So to actually d replicate it would have uh, meant quite a, an apparatus on, on the ice. Not to mention dogs. Mm. Mm. Which you can't Right, you can't dogs. use dogs. According to the Antarctic Treaty, you can't uh, bring any uh, non-indigenous life on the continent. What is the total uh, budget for the expedition? <laughs> that's, the, that's the scary question. Um, it's around about one and a half million dollars. So, not cheap. Uh, what area will you be staging out of? Uh, Punta Arenas in Chile is our is our sort yeah, of jump off, jump off point. Yeah. And what, what are the actual dates that you're going to be there? Um, well, it'll be late October, beginning of November. They have it's very uh, it's very difficult to, to say an exact date because um, the logistics company flying in and out of Antarctica have to it has to be the right weather conditions to fly in. So quite a lot of the. When do you expect to actually be on the continent itself? Well, we hope the beginning of November. But again, it depends on the weather. So you basically sit in Chile waiting. And when they say there's a flight in three hours' time, you get on the plane and you go. So, How many pounds of uh, food will there be on each 300-pound sled? Okay, the, the way that we've got the, the, the weights for this are from previous <coughs> expeditions. So we know roughly what they've got. Um, and it always comes out at about 300, 350 pounds. Um, we can't actually say how much food there's going to be because uh, the food, that, for example, that we were using in the Yukon was heavier than the food that I've used on previous uh, um, uh, camping outings and stuff like that. But you, I mean, you approximate uh, two and a half pounds of food per person per day. So, yeah, but you can't, you can't give it an exact figure until you've actually got the stuff in front of you. Yeah, what sort of boots are you able to no, they're, they're like ski touring boots. So they're um, they're hard plastic boot that um, you can you can unclip them from the ski, but very similar to like a downhill boot. So they're yeah, yeah, you have liners and yeah. So, but we will have to have different boots uh, from what we're going to ski in on a day to day basis. What's the very first thing to look for in a team player when you're when you're doing your recruiting? Um, good communication skills actually is one of my is one of my top things because um, I think that that's a key to 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 anything really. If you can't if you can't em you know set, say to somebody what what you're thinking or what you're feeling or or even you know uh, if you don't approve of a, a plan or something like that then. There's not much point in having you there, is there? <laughs> I have a question about height. Um, is there any ice with freezing levels? So how do you brush your teeth with that if you're going to do that? Oh, the teeth question. Oh, the teeth question. Do, you, do you know what? Before I went to the Yukon, I was thinking exactly the same thing. Yeah, toothpaste does freeze. It's, um, it, it is difficult. So you actually take things in your sleeping bag with you when you go to sleep that you're going to want when you wake up and that might include um, a flask of water because anything that's left outside will just refreeze so yeah toothpaste um, there will be a small amount of it and I'll be keeping it someplace warm <laughs> yeah and um, we won't have the opportunity for a shower or bath for the whole time um, so uh, one thing you can use is, is like baby wipes, but again they freeze. Um, so yeah, you, you, you can take your pack of baby wipes to bed with you. <laughs> That's about it. Really. Uh, sorry. In terms of lessons learned, um, do you relate a lot with the Antarctic Treaty and the Trans-Antarctic Expedition in 57? Um, not so, not as much because they they had motorized vehicles and and that and that sort of thing. But um, but yes, yeah, certainly. 
yeah 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 I mean certainly um, it's a good it's a good reference to look at for for different things I mean I I can't I couldn't tell you how many polar explorers books I've read to to gain little nuggets of information and you do you you just even just a little tiny little tip like um, what was it Felicity you know just just tiny little tips about what they do you know in their routine or, or or something about like the toothpaste or things like that just those little hints and tips are always really really useful I mean okay so for example in the Yukon uh, we talked to a lot of local people about how to survive out in the cold because for the race that we were entering we would have to be um, sleeping on the side of the trail just in a in a bivy bag and a sleeping bag so no tent um and talking to locals, they said, oh, you just put branches down on the ground and then put your mat down, and it keeps out the cold a lot better. Um, and obviously, we're not going to have branches in Antarctica, but little tips and, and hints like that, and certainly gained from uh, previous expeditions, definitely uh, good advice. Uh, did you put all the applicants through this boot camp and then start whittling them out, or did you select <laughs> early? No, I selected... Um, I selected 25 people to interview, and then from the interview took 12 to the. But to I assume the you needed need a, a Scott from the very beginning for the sense of humor. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But she couldn't find one. <laughs> <laughs> one more question. Yeah. I, I think you're planning to write a book about it. Me write a book? No. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that to other people. Um, yeah, I think. Are we going to write a book? Once we, if we're going yeah. to write a book about it, I think I think we're going to have to, um, for sure. Uh, but we we do have an author with us, so <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps we'll just contribute to Glenn's. Uh, so when that book is published, writing. we'll have them back. <laughs> Thank you. We'll have them back either way. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs>